everyone. Uh, the story I want to talk about today is uh, entitled, as they said, Me Moving Aboard, Making the Transition from Coastal to Long Distance Cruising. And in a way, it's our story, my story of my wife, Brenda, and I. Um, so before I go any further, let me give you a little bit of background. Brenda and I met in high school, actually. We met in the library as juniors in high school. We've been sailing together since the 1970s. That's a long time. Brenda was always reluctant and really remains a reluctant partner. But in spite of that, we've spent probably around 1,750 nights together aboard. And that's a lot. Um, and it's really been wonderful. We are, I would define us as seasonal cruisers. We've cruised all of New England for, in fact, we'll be making as part of the Salty Dog Rally to uh, the Down East Rally this summer, our 16th visit to uh, Maine. We've, tr we've been through the Intracoastal Waterway, the Bahamas. We spent a couple of months in Cuba, but most recently the Leeward and, and Windward Islands of the Caribbean, the Lesser Antilles. I'm, I'm an active board member of Salty Dog Sailing Association. I'm excited to be uh, helping to educate you know, those, of, uh, those that want to move into uh, blue water cruising. I'm also port officer for Antigua. I think it's a wonderful place. I'm a port officer both for Salty Dog, the Ocean Cruising Club, and Seven Seas Cruising Association here in my hometown of Essex. And uh, for seven years, I did an event here in Essex uh, for Blue Water Cruisers. This is me and Brenda. Uh, I, I retired in 2012. And uh, that year, we headed down the Intracoastal Waterway and spent eight months aboard. And that was really our first experience in living for an extended period aboard. And I want you to try to get a feel for what that's like, because it's very different than, than vacation cruising, as I would call it. Uh, a little bit of context. This is Pandora. This is our boat. We, uh, we've owned her for about the last six years. She's a 2000, a, 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 excuse me, a 47 foot a composite Aerodyne 47 built in Helsinki, one of three. Uh, it's a good ocean boat, very comfortable, set up for long distance cruising. And we, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but we work hard to make the boat feel like a home. So I want to talk about what is the process kind of in your head of getting from a, being a vacation or a coastal cruiser to spending really months aboard. And while it's very a personal thing, uh, what we did is as Brenda is not as enthusiastic as I am and probably never will be, and that's really not atypical. So those of you that have partners who are as gung-ho or maybe even more gung-ho than you are, count your blessings because more often than not, there's one one person in the group that's really hot to trot and the other one that has to kind of get their arms around the idea. But there's really no better way to get your a partner excited about cruising than to meet other people that did it, that, that do it. And that is really been vital to ours, exposing Brenda to people that did what I wanted to do and what she was concerned about uh, was really fundamental to getting where we got today. So we made a special point of recruiting mentors, people who are liveaboards, people who were seasonal cruisers the way we are. And uh, we also sail regularly with buddy boats. Just, just to have people along, it's a very social activity. We also attend a lot of cruising events. I put on a lot of them myself and we participated in rallies. A couple of events to just think about this year is, and I'm doing these in order of their um, occurrence, and I'll talk a little bit more about the rallies that Salty Dog is putting on a little bit in a moment, but SSCA, which is a terrific group also for uh, getting into the cruising lifestyle is having their annual GAM September 24th to 26th at the Maryland Yacht Club. And we'll be having our annual event at the, S at the uh, Annapolis Yacht Club. Of course, a lot of that depends upon what happens with the pandemic, but we're optimistic about that. You'll be hearing more about that. Of course, you go to the Annapolis Boat Show. Hamptons Cruisers Week is a very popular activity. And then shortly after that is the uh, rally to the Caribbean departure in Hampton. And even if you're not doing the rally, just coming down and being a part of the festivities can be really great. And then once we get to Antigua, we'll have 10 days of arrival events. If you are heading down to Florida, maybe on the ICW, if you're not quite ready for blue water yet, uh, St. Mary's, Georgia, there's a wonderful Thanksgiving event also in Vero Beach. But you really can't underestimate the importance of hanging out with people that have the same thoughts that you do. And read about it, too. This is three books I would strongly recommend, all written by women, interestingly enough. Changing Course, um, A Woman's Guide to, to uh, 
choosing the cruising lifestyle, and then it's your boat too, and then the Voyager's handbook. You can't, you just no end to the kind of information you can get about what it is that you want to do. I recommend what I would call baby steps. Living aboard is a lot different than a vacation. I think a lot of people don't really begin to appreciate this. And they'll often say, well, how can you hang out in a, in a small space with someone for month after month? But it's not that way. Um, but the only way you really know it is to, is to do it. Uh, it, we had a three-year plan. First, we tried a few overnight runs. We did a couple of runs to Maine and so forth. We tried then uh, a couple of months of cruising uh, before I retired. We were able to get some flexibility, so we went to Maine for the whole summer. And it really takes a couple of weeks or even months to cruise and to, to ease into the cruising lifestyle. What we did after that, and I'll talk more about the details of that, we did the intracoastal to Florida. We took two and a half months to get there, but we went to the Bahamas and then on to Caribbean. Along the way, we went to Cuba, but I don't want to torture you with that because you can't do it nowadays, at least not as an American. But boy, when you get the chance, I strongly recommend it. Traveling company. The, the, uh, one of the great things about Salty Dog is the rallies that we do. And these are designed with the idea of helping people get comfortable with being on their boat for more extended distances. The Delmarva Rally, Down East Rally, the Maritime Rally to Canada, which we hope we can run this year, but it's a little unclear as to whether Canada will be open, and then the Caribbean Rally. And they're really something set up in a logical way to help you gain confidence. Now, one thing is that Brenda is just not a blue water kind of girl, and maybe your partner isn't as well, or either. And uh, so one of the great things about doing a rally or even just moving a boat is to use crew. And I've been doing that for over 30 years. And uh, Salty Dog is oriented to helping you. This was actually a departure for one of the rallies to the Caribbean. And there's no reason, there's nothing that says that someone can't fly down to join you. But you say nothing goes to weather like a 737. So as you head out onto the ocean, it can be very different. Some days it looks like this. Some days it looks like this, but always it's interesting. Amazingly, we saw this humpback whale that breached right in front of our boat this summer in Long Island Sound at the eastern end of Long Island Sound. Uh, never in 40 years of cruising have I ever seen that. But for sure, going to Maine, you will see whales. Um, and this year, the plan is to leave the canal first thing in the morning, which means we'd be by Provincetown in the afternoon and almost for sure you'll see whales. It's just an amazing experience. But one way or the other, sailing in company, you get to where you're gonna be and then you get to hang out with people. This is actually a shot of the uh, dockyard in Antigua. And as you can see, this is a, a COVID visit. Uh, to the, uh, the Admiral's Inn in English Harbor. But one way or the other, there's always loads to do. But the point is to really think about your boat as your home. And you have to make room for what you enjoy. You like reading, do you have arts? I mean, one of the things we see a lot of people do is they paint on their boat. They have, because it doesn't take up a lot of space. One of my friends is a professional artist. He makes his living on marine art. And he spent a season in the Bahamas and came back with 60 plein air pieces. The point is that you can bring much of what you want to do with you on the boat and make you feel like you know, it's an extension of your home. We make a special effort also to have nice things on board. Our china and crystal, maybe melamine and lexan, but we try to make it look nice. We personalize the boat with decorations, family photos, and so forth. And we and we both enjoy cooking and want to make sure we can. We also are very conscious of keeping the boat as comfortable as possible and, and taking a lot of the excitement out of things. We have a good solid hard bottom and inflatable and a 15 horse two cycle motor we can count on. It's this family car. We want to make sure that we don't have to worry about it. We have a good solid autopilot. It's important to have one that can hold the course when things get rough because when you get tired and, you, and especially if you're sailing uh, short, short handed, you want to make it as fun as you possibly can. You want to stay warm. This heater buddy, this little heater here is a very nice piece of equipment. It's the only heater you can get that's actually um, uh, approved for use down below because it has a, an automatic CO2 cutoff. But there are times when it's really cold in the cockpit and it's, it's important to have some way of staying warm. And I'll talk more about that in a minute with enclosures and so forth. And also it's, it, it, it just, again, it takes the anxiety out to know 
what the water depth is around you. If you need to get out of a harbor, you're concerned about a change in direction, it's nice to have a handheld depth finder. And I'm not gonna cover all of the equipment needed on this, but just some highlights of things that we find makes our life on board easier. This is our dinghy, it's a Carib, and it's got a nice big tubes and a high rise in the bow. And that's important because when, you, when the going gets really crummy, you just don't want to be coming back from cocktails with friends and having a wave come over your bow just because it's choppy in the harbor. So we try to think about all that because to us, comfort is a priority. You'll notice most people that live on their boat for extended periods have really good covers on their cockpit. They have full enclosures or they have a hard dodger, something to make themselves as comfortable as possible. A good cockpit enclosure increases the space of the boat by a third. I mean, your boat goes from down below to outside, no matter what the conditions are. With our enclosure, we can sit out in a driving rainstorm. I won't say we don't get a few drips here and there, but the point is it's a lot better than wearing foul weather gear while you're having to have, trying to have a glass of wine. And having a, uh, an enclosure is much cheaper than a bigger boat. One of the things we also installed last year that's a really nice feature is a, an engine-driven cabin heater. It basically works on the same principle as you here in your car. It hooks right into the, the engine. And uh, while you need a, a plumber, to, uh, excuse me, an engine guy to install the, uh, the, the plumbing to your engine, it's, it runs very simply. When the engine's running, the coolant goes through it and a fan blows it into the cabin. It's basically free heat. It's inexpensive. They, they use them in the lobster boats and they use them in trucks for, uh, for long haul. So in reality, we're talking something that's like 200 bucks. And that's about the only thing you can buy for the boat that'll cost only $200. We also upgraded our water heater. Now that's not $200, but our water heater, this isotherm will keep water warm for 36 hours. And that matters because you'll be at anchor for days or weeks at a time. And if you feel like a hot shower, you need to know that you won't have uh, hot water one night and the very next morning have it be ice cold. We also spend special attention to our mattress to make sure that it's good quality. Uh, we actually have a custom mattress. That's a pretty, pretty big number. But, we, but, but good quality sheets, new pillows every year, nice towels. We put a memory foam mattress top and also have the Froley mattress springs, which you see down to the right. Those really do keep the bottom of the, of the, um, of, of the, the mattress from getting mildew. It's very nice. And you can't underestimate the importance of being protected from the elements. Be whatever, whether we happen to have a hard dodger, but whether you've got a hard dodger or just a regular uh, dodger, um, it's important to have it be available and comfortable, whether in this case we're under fiberglass, but either way, when the going gets tough, it's nice not to be splashed constantly. And even in the roughest conditions, we don't need uh, foul weather gear unless we're outside. As a general rule, when it's hot, we'll leave the leeward side open and leave the, uh, the windward side uh, closed, and that makes for a good air circulation and yet at the same time keeps out the water. One of the things that causes a lot of stress on a boat is, is, is trying to be a, an electricity Nazi and worrying about running your batteries down. We've changed all our, all our lights to LEDs and we found a good source of super bright LED.com. We put extra insulation in our freezer. Some of the older boats, they don't hold the refrigeration or the cold too well. And a wonderful product It's expensive per square foot, but they're not, you don't need that much. It's called Aerogel and well worth looking into. It is a, the most energy efficient uh, insulating panels you can get. And I believe you can get them with a, with a fiberglass skin on one side so you can put it on the inside of your existing cooler. I'm planning to do more of that this year. Uh, we found that between five and 600 watts of solar, assuming you have good insulation in your freezer and fridge, and we have a very large fridge, will um, is probably your least expensive upgrade to making the boat ener ener energy efficient. Uh, consider lithium. I'm actually looking into that as a possibility, and I'll be reporting back on that as I learn more. But it could it is an amazing uh, upgrade, although the batteries are more expensive. But in my particular case, with 8D batteries, I have four of them. By moving to lithium, I can save 500 pounds in boat weight. That's a remarkable savings. And uh, we also have a very high output alternator, 150 amps at 24 volts, which is actually more almost 300 amps. But we have to have that on a power takeoff because the torque on one of these big alternators will break your existing um, um, brackets. So you have to think about that. And we also, we don't have a, in spite of the fact that it's boat's almost 50 feet long, we do not have a built-in generator. We don't really need it. 
But in a pinch, it's nice to have something to do as a backup power. So I keep a, a Honda 2000 and I can charge batteries if I run into problems and so forth. But this is what our, uh, we have five panels and it's plenty of, plenty of power. But let's talk for a moment about provisioning. Um, in, in, if you're heading south on the ICW, it's gonna take anywhere from one and a half to three months. You really can't move very much per day, but if you go in and out, there's multiple places to stop along the way and it's great places to visit. But you can do it also in installments as you get your feet wet. You don't have to make the whole run. You can fly, fly back for a while if you haven't quite been able to retire or whatever. Do portions of the run offshore. One thing to keep in mind is in the fall with the days are short and fronts are constantly coming through, it's very hard to make that run coastal in a single shot without running into something. We work hard with Chris Parker on the on the rally to the to the Bahamas in particular to pick a, a window that will work, but, it, but you have to be careful about that because the closer you are to the coast, the more fronts that come off. And but in the more in the spring coming coming north is much much easier. Whether you're coming back from the Caribbean or from the Bahamas, it's not hard to get a wi a window that will carry you virtually the whole way. And certainly provisioning, especially when you're going to the Bahamas, is way easier to do that before you go. Not only do you have a car, but you you uh, you have an opportunity to uh, get stuff much much uh, more in inexpensively. Uh, and as a rule, if you don't eat it at home, you probably won't eat it on your boat. And that was a mistake we made the first year we headed to the Bahamas. We were packed up with canned this and canned that, and we came back with it at the end of the season. Nice thing to have is a wheel cart to uh, lug stuff around because you're going to be on foot, which is great. You get lots of exercise. And we plan, we double bag everything because otherwise in the course of a couple of months, it can get a little bit punky in the humidity. And then keep a list so you don't lose stuff by like, and you're going to have a lot of stuff. I mean, this is when we moved aboard Pandora. When we first bought her, it was just a mountain. So you might want to think about converting. I took a, a hanging locker. I've done this on the last two boats and converted it to a, to a, a place to, to put regular provisions. And I found that we just didn't use all the hanging lockers. Also very conscious, you know, as we, you know, if you're living on your boat, you don't want to keep get salt down below on a, on a passage. And these are not very fancy. These were just straight up panels that snap behind it or go with little clips. And I made them myself with my little Sailrite sewing machine. At the end of the trip, I peel them off and uh, rinse them and put them away. And then I have the, the uh, ultra suede has not been salty. The problem is getting stuff salty, it just never gets unsalty. So let's talk about just safety. And I'll talk about safety, not from the context of some of the other talks you might've seen, but really just the calming influence of just making someone feel comfortable being on the boat when they're not used to it and the, doing these long runs. Uh, we, we, we grew up in a time way before AIS and it was at night, especially on coastal cruising, trying to read the lights and figure out what they meant. While it's important to understand them, sometimes it's just really tough and it's so much better to know who's who's coming your way, when they're going to be there, and how close they're going to be, and the name of the boat, so you can talk to them. It just makes it more much more relaxing. And and speaking of relaxing, nothing is more as relaxing than actually staying on the boat. And so we are very assiduous about our use of jack lines, both in the deck and on the cockpit. You just don't want to end up in the water. And we've talked plenty about that in other programs. And the best thing, you, your best safety feature is staying aboard keeping your lanyards, being very tough about it, never leave. We don't even, aboard Pandora, you don't go into the cockpit when you're offshore without having a, without clipping on, even with the, with the enclosure, because you just never know if you're going to hit by a blast and end up on your ear and, and suddenly have to do something and not have, and forget to clip on and fall out of the boat. Um, we have a life raft, of course, that's really important, and, but more than anything, it's just it's nice to know it's there. I still remember the first time we left the Cape Cod Canal to go to Maine. It was my very first overnight. There were two other boats with me. And as we pulled out, this is at a time we didn't have AIS. We didn't have a life raft. We didn't have an EPIRB. It was all very exotic at the time. And uh, I thought, holy cow, I have no right being out here. But we made it. And after countless uh, trips and nights offshore, just having the right equipment makes all the difference in the world. And of course, an EPIRB is, is really vital for, e I don't think you should be outside a cell range without an EPIRB, frankly, excuse me, a, a VHF range. And stuff breaks, 
but no problem because you'll have spares. At least we have spares. We keep, I'm not gonna read through this whole list, but if, if it's vital, especially for a boat like mine, it's 24 volts. You can't just go into a chandlery and buy a new water pump for, for the uh, domestic pump. So I keep copies or uh, ex, uh, over, I keep extras of every pump. And when they start to go bad, I rebuild them and put them into uh, inventory for the next time. I think one of the biggest safety things I worry about is an uncontrolled jibe. And uh, the, the, the uh, easy, the jibe easy by Wishard on the upper left is one of two uh, ideas that are there to control the jibe of a boom. Nothing is quite as, as unsettling as an uncontrolled and potentially devastating if you get hit by the boom or it breaks is an uncontrolled jibe. And that becomes a particular acute issue when you have a crew that aren't that familiar with the boat. You just never know what might happen. But a jibe easy is a really great uh, way to control things and keep, keep it from getting out of hand. Uh, I'm not gonna go into a lot of details about communication and navigation, except to say that there's a lot of options. And staying in touch, whether you're in the US or the Bahamas, or in, in the Caribbean is getting easier and easier. We are big fans of the Google Fi phone, which works wonderfully in the Caribbean and the Bahamas. You could use it as a hotspot. We have friends that we talk to regularly on WhatsApp and, uh, and FaceTime and so forth. And, and if you're really a data hog, get a local SIM card. And, and for less than $100 a month, you can watch movies in many of these harbors. The point is that the, every year it gets easier and easier. Whether you're using a sat phone or a sideband radio, it's nice to be able to stay in touch with people. One thing we're very conscious of is backup. And uh, when we have our primary plotters, both under the Dodger and in the, in the, in the cockpit uh, at, the, at the nav station, uh, we have the primary plotter as well as paper charts, and we use an iPad as backup. And uh, of course, PC and with, with a, a, a GPS connection in the case of failure of pretty much everything else. Uh, I've, used, I've been using crew, as I mentioned, for 40 years. And in picking crew, just a few thoughts on that. Uh, people often will say, well, so how big is your boat? And I say, well, it depends upon how far it is from the dock. And the farther you out into the ocean, it can really, really seem small. And if you have bad crew on board, then it's really, really small. So my recommendation is um, pick people that if you, if you can, you get to know them. One of the nice things about FaceTime or, uh, or uh, Zoom for that matter is you can really meet people and get to know them a little bit. Um, check references, uh, think about their experience and, and how they react under pressure. Are, are they a know-it-all, those sorts of things. We, on Pandora, I like three crew, me plus two others. A lot of people use four. I find it gets a little crowded, but the four is probably ideal because if someone gets sick and, and pretty much always, people will end up seasick in spite of their best effect if they're not used to it. Uh, but it's really tough to run a boat with just two as we found during our uh, flotilla coming home from the Caribbean last year with all the boats that came along with Salty Dog. Is there was, it was tough with, with inexperienced or uh, shorthanded. Uh, in terms of watch, we try to make it as easy as we possibly can. It depends upon the skill. But for me, it's four hours on, four hours off. I kind of like that. And everyone gets seasick. It's just a matter of whether it's not been rough enough yet. So we recommend taking something for the first two days and we don't need any heroes who think they won't get sick and then do. And then of course, finally, do they have, I'm a neat Nick. I can't stand uh, people who leave messes behind. So it's important to pick people that are kind of like you. And most of the time it works out well, if you think, think it through and pick the right people. But more often than not, I mean, really what it comes down to is cruising is like a movable neighborhood. You see people in one place you, a year later, a month later, a week later, you see them again. So to me, moving uh, in through the cruising lifestyle is really a matter of taking baby steps. And, and our baby steps have been included trips to Maine. And this summer I'll be doing that and leading the group from Newport up to Maine um, with the Salty Dogs. And hopefully I'll see some of you there. But it's an opportunity to try an overnight, just a single overnight from the Cape Cod Canal up to Maine. It's a really wonderful opportunity to spend time with people that uh, share your dream and the spectacular scenery. This harbor here, this is actually a boat we owned many years ago at Tartan 37. And this, that harbor is as tiny as it looks. We had to take a mooring fore and aft and, and, and even then it was tight. But 
it is just there's no place I if, if I'll tell you honestly if if uh, if if the if the uh, water was warm in Maine and the seasons were as nice as they are in the Caribbean I'd like Maine more and it's a nice place to come and leave a boat where I'll be leaving the boat up there for a couple of months and coming and going a few different times it's a great place to kind of get into things and you just can't beat how beautiful it is and the ability to see these spectacular uh, dude schooners and look at waking up in the morning with a a, a thing of wildflowers into an absolutely placid spot. In fact, uh, this is this is a, a little harbor that we're likely to be in this this year. The next stop is maybe taking the uh, ICW to Florida or going offshore if you're a little more adventurous. But just a couple of highlights of the ICW. Uh, don't try to do the ICW if you have a seven or eight foot draft boat. It, it can be very, very tough. You have to have a mast that's under 65 feet, and I mean under 65 feet. There's a lot of places to anchor, and one of the basic truths of cruising is the farther south you get, setting aside, of course, Miami and Fort Lauderdale, it gets to be pretty inexpensive if you want it to uh, tie up in a marina. Some of them are even free in some of the towns and so forth, but Georgia and the Carolinas is really challenging. And But if you play the tides through Georgia, it's nine foot. So you can get through pretty much anything, but the tides and, and currents can be pretty tremendous. Basically the, uh, the, the ICW begins in uh, just near Hampton, in fact, mile marker number one, but by the time you get to Miami, that's 1,089. If you wanted to do every day and never just push, 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 that's 55 miles is about the best you're going to do every day because of the short days and so forth, and that's 20 days. So maybe the best thing is to do an offshore run. But if you want to, it is a wonderful experience, whether you're going through the Dismal Swamp Canal or down in Beaufort seeing the wild horses out on the banks. It is, it is just the greatest place and to really reconnect and, sp and spend time. Once you get down into the um, into the low country and in, in Charleston, just an amazing number of places to, to, to go. After that, maybe you wanna think about taking a bigger jump and going to the Bahamas. You, you can do it from Florida. A couple of the ICW, a couple of the salty dogs last year, the weather was pretty challenging. So they went inshore and then sailed over from Florida. It's only 50 miles across the Gulf Stream. And uh, four to five days at sea with a salty dog rally will get you there with lots of support. And having sailed all the areas we have, basically the whole East Coast and, and throughout the Caribbean and Bahamas, um, you will never find more beautiful beaches than you'll find in the Bahamas. And the water is probably the clearest you'll ever see anywhere. Um, fabulous diving and snorkeling, but you've really got to have that depth of probably six feet or less or you're going to feel constrained. Uh, our last boat had had six, five ten, and it was really pretty easy. And Pandora was six and a half foot. That six inches makes a pretty big difference. Celebrate! You celebrate your milestones. You did it. You you made it to the Bahamas. You made it down the intracoastal. You spent three months on the boat. You've got a lot to a lot to celebrate. And in fact, the people in this picture. This was on our first. This is celebrating Ben's birthday. Our very first trip to the Bahamas. And Bill back there in the corner. Bill Woodruff on Kaluna Moo. Um, he's a member of Salty Dog and is celebrating his 10th year living aboard this May. Bahamas is a really cool place. It's got a tremendously strong English influence. And as I mentioned, the scenery is pretty spectacular. Uh, the, 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 you can tell the water depth by the color. And, and if you like shelling, um, what, what, a, what a wonderful place. And if you feel like swimming with sharks, or for you like feeding the pigs at, at, um, at, at, at a big major spot, you can do that. But everywhere you go, there are other cruisers. People, again, like you, that want, that want to share this lifestyle. And that's part of, I think, really what makes cruising such a wonderful thing to do. And to how do you kind of get your head around it, especially for someone that might be resistant. And with the prevailing winds in the Bahamas and the Caribbean always out of the east, this means this is your view out of the back of your boat every evening as the sun sets over, over the horizon. So let's just talk for, as we get to wrap up here a little bit about the, uh, the Caribbean and the Salty Dog Rally to same. And this is just as a list a few, a few years ago of, of just showing what the track was for the fleet. A lot of boats. Amazingly, in spite of the fact that we had 80 boats heading south, 
Um, after a day, you generally don't see anybody. I mean, I could go sometimes four or five days without seeing another boat. And that really gets also to a point about sailing at night. And that's a really big hurdle for a lot of people. And if you've grown up like we have sailing Long Island Sound, sailing at night can be really daunting because you've got lights on the shore. It's, you know, is that a flashing light from a, a tail light on a car? Is that a red, a, a red mark? You know, what is it? But once you're offshore, with AIS going, and if you if you see something, it's probably a single boat on the horizon as opposed to this cacophony of lights everywhere. It's much, much easier, much more relaxing to be offshore than it is to be inshore at night. It's only a, it's a pretty good hike. Um, just to give some context, at 1,500 miles from Hampton, that's assuming a, a rum line, as you can see from this track, it's not a rum line usually, it's a little bit of back and forth and so forth, but it's actually only a, less than 100 miles further than going to the British Virgin Islands, which is a place a lot of people know from their chartering days. People tend to think Antigua is a far away, but it's, it's not that far. Um, and some have suggested the Caribbean begins in Antigua. And uh, this is not the time to talk about that in detail. If you have interest, there's other presentation I did about sailing the, uh, the Lesser Antilles that gives a lot of detail about uh, how wonderful that area of the world is. But down there, cruising sailboats dominate. And there's a tremendous variety of islands. The French islands with the food and wine, rainforest, the beaches. It offers probably more variety than within a 200 mile range than any place else you can go. Um, Doing a, an offshore run, certainly going down to the Bahamas, offshore, down to the Caribbean, if you like to fish, um, bigger the lure, the bigger the fish. So my recommendation, is if, you, if you have anything bigger than a six-inch lure, watch out. This one I caught with a little lure. So you want to make sure that you don't have, uh, have too, much, uh, too much dead fish to deal with on your boat. But once you get down to the Bahamas, to the Caribbean, excuse me, this is Nelson's Dockyard, you're entering some of the most spectacular scenery you'll see anywhere. This, the Nelson's Dockyard is, a, is, is the only working Georgian dockyard in the world, and it's still true to its history as, the, as the, uh, the center of the British Empire in the Caribbean. It's a beautiful spot. And that one of our, one of our members uh, took this wonderful picture uh, with his drone um, this year of the arrival, all those boats, with the exception of that big schooner off to the off to the right, are salty dog boats. And uh, without the salty dogs, Antigua wouldn't have had anybody. And speaking a little bit about the history, uh, one of the my favorite parts of, of Antigua is the uh, the Antigua and Barbuda Royal Naval Tot Club, where every evening they get together to toast the Queen and to learn a little bit about British naval history. And uh, they have been kind enough to host us for our own special tot of rum for the last couple of years. It's a great thing. And we do a lot of events down in Antigua to uh, make people feel like the trip was worth it. And uh, all this winter, most people stuck there for the entire season because moving from country to country was just too challenging. Uh, with all the restrictions. So there was well over a hundred uh, dogs that hug, hung out for a couple of months and life was pretty normal. <clears throat> but as you do this, you will find, you will meet many, many people. This is a party, one of many parties we've had over the years with fellow dogs and cruisers and people that we've become very close friends with. <clears throat> and it might also be fun while you're down there to see how the one percenters are. This is a, one of the largest sailboats in the world. This is EOS, owned by uh, Diane von Furstenberg and Barry Deller. Um, certainly in a different class, but at the height of the season two years ago, there were 80 mega yachts in Antigua. But no shortage of cruisers. It's really a very, very popular place with cruisers. So I'll leave you with just a couple of quick slides of other areas. But boy, there is nothing that beats uh, New Year's Eve in Antigua with you're sitting on the bow of your boat having a, a rum and coke. French islands, getting down to Guadeloupe and Martinique, seeing the Pitons in St. Lucia, that we were on a mooring in 150 feet of water, uh, a, a really amazing place to be. Beautiful architecture of, of St. Martin. We were there for a uh, carnival, three days of just craziness and really, really fun. Beautiful beaches, 
getting down into Martinique. And if you feel like you need some civilization, try the uh, Marigot Beach Club in, um, in Marigot, St. Lucia. Um, pay 30 bucks for a, for a mooring out in that harbor and you have the run of the place. If you want to stay in the rooms, it's about 600 a night. And if you decide you don't want to make the run home, you could either leave your boat in Trinidad, maybe, if they open that up, or leave it in Grenada, or put it on a boat and run it to the Caribbean, run it, uh, excuse me, run it to the Med, run it back to uh, Newport, whatever. But uh, out of Martinique, there's a constant parade of ships taking boats elsewhere. But one thing for sure, you're going to make friends. The cruising lifestyle is a wonderful way to meet people that share your dream and whether you're a little kid looking out over Shirley Heights and appreciating the sunset, or you're an adult thinking about what the next day will bring, I just cannot emphasize how much fun it is to spend time with fellow cruisers. So with that, I hope you'll do it. I hope I'll see you either in Maine or see you in the Caribbean. I'll be there. I'll be in Antigua.